Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is James Shapiro. James is Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, and best known for his book 1599, A Year in the Life of William Shakespeare, for which he won the 2006 Samuel Johnson Prize. For his new book, he has ventured into choppy waters to tackle the claims that the plays attributed to Shakespeare were not written by him at all, but by Francis Bacon or the Earl of Oxford or any of a host of other contenders. His interest is not in charting each one of these myriad claims and counterclaims, but in exploring what impulses, what cultural forces underpin these often vehement attempts to topple Shakespeare from his pedestal. It's a cause which has numbered many eminent figures, such as Freud and Mark Twain, among its devotees. When I met James, I began by asking him to explain what exactly he was in pursuit of in this book. What I thought I was in pursuit of wasn't entirely clear to me when I began. What originated really as an exploration of a subject that had been largely taboo in academic circles turned into an exploration of the extent to which Shakespeare scholars, as much as anti-Stratfordians, were responsible for the whole belief that Shakespeare didn't write the plays. What do I mean by that? What I ended up learning in this book was that at the root of the question, who wrote Shakespeare, were certain assumptions about the relationship between a writer and his work. And these tended to be autobiographical assumptions. We live in an age of memoir in which we assume everybody, whether a fiction writer or a nonfiction writer, is telling his or her own stories in the works. And to a large extent, that's true of 20th century and much 21st century literature. But that wasn't true of Shakespeare's day. Yet this was an assumption that's shared by all those who don't believe Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare, as well as many who do. There are those, and I count myself among them, who would stand in front of classes and say, The Tempest is an autobiographical work, Shakespeare's great leave-taking, Shakespeare's Prospero. Now, once you believe that these works are autobiographical, then almost anything goes. You can believe they were written by a man who was a doctor, a lawyer, a butcher, or a countess. You can believe, or might believe, that they were written by somebody other than Shakespeare. If, say, the Earl of Oxford had been captured by pirates and had three daughters, shouldn't he have a greater claim to have written Hamlet and King Lear than someone like Shakespeare of Stratford who didn't? So that way madness lies. What I try to do in this book is not go tit for tat with the various arguments saying Oxford had three daughters, Shakespeare did not, but rather look at the underlying assumptions and the history of this controversy. I became very quickly less interested in what people thought and much more interested in why they thought what they did and when they began thinking that. And that took me back to the origins of the controversy And along the way, the controversy was believed to have started in the late 18th century. And it turns out that the document that dates to that time is a forgery. That was one of the the most surprising and exciting finds in writing this book. Since 1850, over 50 or so candidates have been proposed as the author of these works. And all of them have been based, all of these arguments or all these claims have been based on two kinds of arguments one autobiographical, the other topical, which is to say that the stories that the plays tell are not really about the plays themselves, but about what's going on in the world at that time. And all I've tried really hard to do in this book is explain why people began to think that and what's really wrong-headed about it. And it's a book, in a sense, about why smart people think dumb things. Uh, we all know a lot of smart people in our lives who say and think dumb things, this particular controversy has attracted more of them than the average subject matter. Sigmund Freud, Henry James, Mark Twain, and in our own day, Supreme Court justices, leading actors of the British stage. So I became fascinated with what underlying assumptions they might have that would lead them to believe that Shakespeare did not write the plays. What had happened by the mid to late 18th century, what was the shift? You mentioned this interpretation that literature was essentially autobiographical. 
and also the fact that for the, the first century and a half after Shakespeare's death, there was no question about authorship. So what was it that was changing? One, one of the things that I learned in writing this book, and I've been teaching Shakespeare for a quarter century, and I learned a lot. Uh, one of the things I learned was that no one thought these works were autobiographical, the sonnets or the plays, until the end of the 18th century. And that's when Edmund Malone, the greatest Shakespeare scholar of his day, and perhaps of all time, frustrated they couldn't complete a cradle-to-grave biography of Shakespeare, cheated a bit. And what do I mean by that? He was a, an exposure of forgers and fakes and frauds of all kinds. But he forged connections between the life and the works. He came upon Sonnet 93, the one that begins describing how the speaker is like a deceived husband. And he decided, based on his reading of that sonnet, that Shakespeare must have been talking about his own relationship with Anne Hathaway, who must have been cheating on him when he was away in London and she in Stratford. And he constructs a whole story about how she didn't deserve him and the marriage was terrible. It might have been terrible, it might have been wonderful. We have no idea and no access to this. And in fact, George Stevens, another great Shakespearean at the time, warned Malone, don't go there, don't open up this Pandora's box. Malone did. And he's writing right at the end of the 18th century. The Romantics, Coleridge, Wordsworth, the Schlegels in Germany, seized on this way of reading because it so resembled the autobiographical work that they were doing in works like Wordsworth's The Prelude and other major works of this period. It was so attractive that it soon began to become almost a game of identifying where Shakespeare is telling his own stories in his works. The hardest thing for readers and scholars to accept is this is a post-19th century construction. As much as we think we find Shakespeare in his works, we're putting him there. And you see in the book, repeated again and again, the great difficulty which people have in dealing with the fact that Shakespeare had been essentially deified by this time. And at the same time, what we knew about the life of the man was, I think in the words of Henry James, supremely vulgar. Yes. And the, in, in some way, some account had to be given of how these works had come from this man. One of the things that I had to navigate was the story of how Shakespeare's life was invented and reinvented. Most of us turn to the latest biographies and discover what the man was like. But in fact, all of these little bits and pieces that fit into modern biographies were discovered independently and over time, so that the story of Shakespeare keeps changing. In the 17th century, we have anecdotes a couple of generations after Shakespeare died circulating, and they tell one kind of story. But once the hunt was on for documents, the only documents that survived, that would probably survive for most of us, are legal ones business arrangements, real estate, marital, birth, death records, and the like. And of the handful that survived for Shakespeare, many of them have to do with financial dealings or legal dealings. And because of that, the biography began to go in the direction of Shakespeare, a money-grubbing, grain-hoarding merchant. And even as that movement was taking place, the deification of Shakespeare as the greatest writer in English and maybe of all time was taking place. The gap between the biographical gritty facts and the hagiographic biographical story grew so great that eventually the weight of it forced people to begin to argue around the 1840s and 1850s that somebody else must have written these plays.